Hi, um, my name is Anna Gjnoabusa. I'm the director of the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies. And it is my great pleasure to introduce to you today um, our speaker, James Robinson. He's the David Florence Professor in the Department of Government at Harvard University, and has taught for many years in the summer at the University of the Andes in Bogota, Colombia as well. He received his PhD in economics at Yale University and taught at the universities of Melbourne, Southern California, and Berkeley before coming to Harvard. As many of you know, he is a world-renowned expert in development and the ways in which political and economic institutions underpin both economic progress and democracy. He's also the author of five books and over 30 articles. These have sought to answer major fundamental questions such as why nations fail, why Africa remains poor, under what economic conditions do democracies arise and autocracies persist, um, and for those of us with kids who have long considered the question, is child labor inefficient? Um, a lead article in the journal Political Economy. <laughs> And in recognition of this fundamentally important work, James Robinson has received numerous awards and honors, including several invited lectures and keynote addresses. So we're delighted to welcome him today to the University of Michigan and very much look forward to his lecture entitled Acting Like a State. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much, Anna. Uh, yeah, whoa, child labor. Yes, that's, a, that's a really a blast from the past. I used to, I used to be a real development economist. Uh, so, so uh, I haven't worked on that topic for a while, but perhaps I should come back to it. Uh, so, so today I'm going to give a, a very different talk than I usually uh, give. Uh, so, 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 uh, so you'll see if you like it or not. I'm, I'm going to. I was on sabbatical in in Bogota uh, last academic year, and I started uh, with a whole. I started on a very large uh, project, a sort of collaborative project with different people. Uh, this sort of. There's lots of different projects, pro larger projects, smaller projects. I'll talk about one project today. If I have time at the end, I could spend a little bit talking about the larger project. Uh, 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 and, and, you know, and there's various incarnations of that. So this is a project that roughly I've been working on with Juan Sebastián Galán, who was a student of mine in uh, Los Andes, who started a PhD at Harvard uh, in September, and marrying Helica Bautista at Brown, who's sitting just over there. So, What's this about? Well, it's a sort of super empirical sort of study of uh, paramilitary groups in... Sorry, we'll just spread a video. I, I, I tend to talk very loudly. Talk, can't everyone hear me? It, it, what I'm going to talk about today is a sort of it's a super empirical uh, study of how paramilitary groups in Colombia organize, organize uh, historically. And what's this business acting like a state? And the Frente José Luis Zuluaga is a particular paramilitary group that I'm going to talk a lot about sort of centrally today. But the, re the reason I think this is interesting, sort of, it's sort of intrinsically interesting, is that I think it's a window onto kind of state formation and processes that create state-like organizations. So I guess the meta sort of project is to try to think about uh, questions of state formation through this lens of paramilitary groups. So you're going to hear a lot about MacGyver today. So MacGyver, MacGyver, you know, the TV, your TV character, uh, MacGyver. So all Colombian paramilitaries have nicknames. So this is his MacGyver, MacGyver. They call it MacGyver in Colombia. So I'm going to call him MacGyver. You'll see him in a second. Uh, this is something he said to me. Not a chicken in the town moved unless I authorized it. So I'll talk a lot about how he organized his town and his, OK. So I do want to talk about this in great detail. You know, uh, there's a huge literature in sociology, political science, uh, history. Economists have kind of woken up and realized in the last couple of years this is sort of an interesting topic. So they're sort of rushing in, uh, like the Seventh Cavalry. Uh, there's this, you know, question of state, state authority. Uh, you know, uh, what explains comparative patterns of state authorities? You know, archaeologists are super interested in this topic. What they call pristine state formation. Why was there a state, you know, in the Nile Valley or the Niger Bend, and you know, uh, what mechanisms lead to the creation of states? So, what are the incentives to create state-like institutions? Why do states differ a lot in what they do in terms of the provision of public goods, order, roads, all sorts of things? To what extent, you know, to think about Weber's famous uh, definition of the state. To what extent are states able to establish something like a legitimate uh, monopoly of violence? 
And why are, another kind of very barbarian question, why are states organized in different ways? Why are, them very, why are some very patrimonial and others are more kind of rational, legal, using rules as opposed to patronage in order to structure their organizations? Okay, so there's a vast literature which I'm definitely not going to make any attempt whatsoever to survey on this topic in social science. There's also, I'll have something to say a little bit, uh, a much more recent literature which you might also think is relevant to what I'm going to talk about on what's called rebel governance, which is about how rebel <coughs> groups and actors in civil wars uh, organize. Okay, so, so this is, I want to use this history of paramilitarism to uh, talk about this. Okay, so uh, what paramilitary group? Well, I'm going to talk about a particular paramilitary group, uh, which is this. So here they are. Uh, this is a paramilitary group. It's called the uh, Self-Defense Peasants of the Middle Magdalena. So this is, I'll, show, I'll talk about the geography in a second. And this was a paramilitary block which was run by this gentleman here called Ramon Isaza, called El Viejo, like the, the old guy. Uh, and he, he was the head of the whole thing. And the whole thing comprised six different fronts. Okay? He himself uh, ran the central front, the Frente Central. And here were the commanders of the other fronts. On the right here, this is Magiva. So he was called uh, Luis Eduardo Zuluaga. So here's Magiva. Uh, he ran this particular front. Uh, this is what he looks like now. He's a bit, he's got a tie and he's shaped up now. He took his combat fatigues off. Uh, this is what he looked like when he demobilized in 2006. So that was one front. Then this is the front, uh, John Isaza, run by uh, Roque. Let's call him Roque. I'll just go with the nicknames because it's easier to remember. So he's, this is the front, Frente John Isaza. This is the, uh, the Frente Héroes del Prodigio. So it's, uh, this was run by uh, Terror, was his nickname. These two gentlemen are sons of Ramon Isaza. And Magiva was actually married to a daughter of Moni, Ramon Isaza, so that they're all very related. You'll see this is sort of interesting. So this is Terror. Uh, he was, this is his front. This gentleman is called uh, El Gure, the armadillo, uh, Walter Ochoa Gisao. He was running uh, Frente Omar Isaza. And this gentleman was called Pajaro, a uh, bird. He ran the Celestino Mantilla front. Okay, so there were six fronts. These were the commanders. Uh, these uh, two fronts were named after uh, other sons of uh, Ramon Isaza who died, who were killed in the conflict. You know, what is the conflict? The conflict, of course, is the civil war in Colombia between left-wing kind of armed groups, particularly what's called the FARC and the ELN, and these guys. These are paramilitaries. They were primarily in the business of fighting the FARC. Let me tell you where they were in Colombia. Uh, uh, here's the middle of Magdalena. So here's Bogota, the capital city. Up there is Medellin. Uh, so, so this is the middle of Magdalena. Magdalena River runs right up the middle of that. This red box was roughly their territory uh, from 1977 when they started to 2006 when they demobilized. Uh, if we go into it uh, in more detail, I can show you a map of the, their different groups. Uh, so uh, the blue is uh, based in a town called La Mercedes, Puerto Triunfo, in a municipality called Puerto Triunfo, uh, which was where Isaza was from and where he started his first group in 1977 and they gradually expanded over time. The red group, the red thing there is uh, Magiva's uh, front. The, the, uh, this yellow thing here is uh, El Gure, uh, his, uh, the, what's called the Foy, the, the Omar Isaza, his thing. This is where Pajaro was on the other side of the river. See the Magdalena River goes right up the middle. This is where the Celestino Mantilla front uh, was. Uh, this orange bit was where Roque was, and then the green bit, which links a, a municipality called Puerto Nare up there, and this bit down here in the department of Caldas is where Terror was. So he was sort of in two different places. Okay, so, so there are these uh, six fronts. I could tell you a little bit about the history of them. I know the history is not that important, just to talk about uh, some of the history and like where the sources of this discussion are going to come from. As I said, they started in 1977. Isaza started with a group of 10 guys called the Shotgunners, uh, who essentially uh, got mad at the expansion of the FARC into that area. So the left-wing FARC expanded into this eastern Antioquia in the 1970s. They started kidnapping people. They started charging like what they call the vacuna, which is like a tax. They started taxing people. 
Uh, they formed a group of people who just tenored them with shotguns. They went up into the mountains and started trying to kill uh, the FARC guerrillas. Uh, they then came to the attention of local elites, big cattle ranchers who were sort of getting people kidnapped and stuff. And then they famously rescued one of these cattle ranchers from the FARC. So then they became famous in the area. They started getting money, better guns, more recruits. Uh, they started expanding. Uh, they merged in the 1980s with another paramilitary group called the Auto Defenses del Puerto Boyacá, which is just on the other side of the river from Puerto Triunfo. This was a sort of, they reluctantly merged. I won't go into the details of that, not terribly important. In 1993, they managed to, Isaza managed to split and he formed this ACMM. And in 2006, in the late 1980s, that's when he kind of created that structure I showed you. So the structure here is, you know, I'm not going to talk about the dynamics of it. What I'm really going to talk about in terms of the organization and the data I have is from the period from about 2000 to when they demobilized in 2006. So President Uribe, in his first term, passed something called the Peace and Justice Law. And when he put the Peace and Justice Law persuaded about 30,000 paramilitaries uh, to demobilize in Colombia, about 34 different paramilitary blocs. And the ACMM uh, was one of them. And when they demobilized, they had about 1,200 people. This was actually, this is far less, probably under a half of the people who are actually in the paramilitary block. But some of them just sort of disappeared into the, you know, forest and... They never appeared when they demobilized. So about 1,200 people demobilized. And we have very detailed information on this. For example, they had to fill in a survey. I can show you some of that data later on at the time of the demobilization. Okay? This peace and justice process is, is the main source of information that I'm, for stuff I'm going to talk about today. Because what happened with the peace and justice process is that in order to get, in exchange for uh, uh, reduced sentences, meaning maximum eight years in prison, uh, the paramilitaries had to... Uh, basically confess what they did. And the judicial institutions in Colombia launched this amazing investigation into the origins of paramilitarism and the structures. And they've been collecting huge amounts of data. So what we've been doing over the last year and a half is just trying to access some of this information, which is in thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of legal documents in which you have to beg, plead, you know, uh, ingratiate yourself with the powers that be and somebody will give you a few pages of something and, you know, anyway, so it's a long process. Uh, but, but the main source of information for what I'm going to talk about is documents from the legal proceedings against this uh, paramilitary group that's been going on for the last six years. Uh, we've also talked extensively to McGeever and also uh, field work, as I'll talk a little bit about. Okay, so, uh, so, so what, what am I going to try to do in here is let me start by describing how particularly, in the, for the sake of brevity, I'm going to talk in detail about how this one front, I showed you their territory, that Magiva ran. I'm going to tell you in some detail how they were organized, how they behaved, what they did. And I'm going to try to argue that this looks exactly like a state to me. That's not what they say. So if you say, they, they wouldn't call it a state. They like to call themselves the de facto authority. We weren't the state. There's a state in Bogota. You know, of course, the state doesn't actually do anything here. They love to talk about the absence of the state. But we weren't the state. We were the de facto authority. So I, you know, I'm not going to quibble about the description. I'm just going to try to describe like, how they behaved and operated and what they did. And then you can decide for yourself whether you think that's a state or not. But the interest of the, so I'm going to talk about that in great detail because that's something we've investigated in detail. So we checked lots of stuff. Uh, and then I'm going to try to talk about the comparative picture between the different fronts and try to talk about the variation across the fronts and then try to talk about what kind of hypothesis might explain this variation. Okay, so that's going to be the strategy. So what was this, what was this uh, Frente Jose Luis Zuluaga like? Okay, well, first of all, they had a kind of legal system. So uh, they had a, do a written document uh, which uh, called, is called the Estatutos. Here's the first page of it. Estatutos of the Frente Jose Luis Zuluaga, which was a, a set of kind of legal principles governing uh, the behavior of the people in the front and how they interacted uh, with society. So uh, in paramilitary training, they had several paramilitary training camps in their territory. Uh, they 
during, there was a basic three-month training. If you were recruited by the paramilitaries, you went, underwent a basic three-month training. And they, you had to memorize these estatutos during your three months uh, training. Okay? So, and there's a lot of evidence, I won't be able to talk about that probably, about how these things were implemented. Okay? Because these are lawyers investigating this. So the lawyers are very interested in the legal side of stuff and how legal proceedings took place, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about the estatutos. They had a relatively bureauc bureaucratized organization, okay, with functional specialization between different parts of the bureaucracy, and it was remarkably unpatrimonial. I'll give some very specific examples of how it was unpatrimonial. Uh, this is just the one of these six fronts, okay? Uh, they regulated trade and social life. They had curfews and they had times when you had to turn the music down and after which the disco had to close. Uh, they, had an, they had an ideology. They had a hymn. They had a prayer. They had a radio station called Integration in Stereo. And they gave out medals, uh, the Order of, San Fra of uh, Francisco de Paula Santander and the Grand Cross of Gold. So they gave medals to members for spectacular acts of uh, bravery. One of the uh, remarkable things about the Estatutos is the claim that these were applied in an even-handed way between, perhaps this is part of the non-patrimonial business, even-handed way between the people in the block and the front and outside the block. So this is just from uh, court proceedings. The magistrate asks uh, McGeever, uh, but you say, did you put sanctions equally to civilians and members of the organization? Yes, and McGeever says, one spends a lifetime trying to win people's trust, and you lose it in one second. I'm going to talk later on about how many people he killed. Uh, so, but you know, this is, I think, a very interesting. Okay, so I, let me not talk about the. I'm not going to talk about the these these law cases in detail. But there's a lot of evidence of how they actually tried people, including members of their own block. So they executed members of their own uh, block, for example for serious violations of these uh, statues, and they had a process uh, for uh, implementing them. Uh, uh, they also, I'm not sure if they, they independently innovated the concept of three strikes and you're out. Uh, I guess Bill Clinton was very keen on that at some point. Uh, they had various, you know, so there was different sorts of, the estatutos are kind of incomplete in the sense that the estatutos don't have a, they don't have a, very detailed mapping from particular violations of rules into the, the, uh, what type of penalty you got. And they're also somewhat you know, inaccurate in the sense that they talk about these taxes. I'll talk about the taxes. We know a lot about the finances, as I'll tell you. Uh, they talk about these taxes, and they say all taxes are voluntary, but that's definitely not true. Uh, so there's you know, inaccuracies in the, stat in the estatutos. Uh, but you know, but they, they developed these, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to get at this question of, you know, how do you decide you know, uh, on this penalty for this crime and things like that. And that just seems to have been some evolutionary process where they kind of made something up to start with and then it got institutionalized and they stuck to it and things like that. So you know, they fined people 10,000 pesos for all sorts of different you know, offenses if your horse roamed about town you know, you didn't tie it up, then you'd get fined 10,000 pesos, you know, but if you, you'd get two warnings, you know, and then some, they could take the horse off, you know, a horse off you. Uh, robbery, uh, more serious crimes, led to kind of community work, you know, mending roads, sweeping the town, uh, or economic sanctions, maybe more fines. Again, uh, two times, uh, but then something much more serious if you, if you carried on violating rules. Uh, taxes. Let me show you the organogram. Uh, here's the organogram of the, the front. Uh, here's Magiva up at the top. Here's the military uh, command structure. Okay? So uh, Carmelo uh, was the military uh, commander. And then there were different commanders in different municipalities where they were. So in Carmen de Viboral or La Union, there was Julio, there was Marcos. Uh, Magiva had a, he also had a group for a while in Comuna Treze, which is a big shanty town in the suburbs of Medellin, uh, and he had a commander there. Uh, in Sonson and Argelia, there was Freddy Bongo, who was the military commander, and then Pedrito and Arturo were in, Son were in Sonson Bajo, that's part of the municipality of Sonson, and San Francisco, which is another municipality. Okay? Uh, on this side are the, what they call the financieros. So they had a 
bureaucratic arm which was just in charge of collecting taxes. Okay? So these were civilians in the sense that they were not armed, they didn't have combat fatigues on or guns. Uh, and they were similarly allocated to all these municipalities in order to levy uh, taxes. I'll talk more about the finances. They taxed the production of milk and potato. Uh, they also taxed most landowners and businessmen. Uh, they taxed uh, drug dealers. Uh, and you know, so they, they levied all sorts of taxes. And they even charged, um, uh, I don't know what the word is. What's the word? They, like, they had peajes. So they, had, like, they would charge people on the road. You know, so, so, so you know, like a toll. They had tolls on the road. And they would even issue like, bits of paper you know, when you paid your toll, they would give you a bit of paper uh, for having done it. This is the political side. So they had the, there was a th three split between the military, the tax bureaucracy, and the uh, political side. And the, who were these, these, these politicos? The politicos were the people that kind of interfaced with the community, okay? So trying to get information about the left-wing guerrillas, where they were, what their activities were, trying to tell people about the mission, of the paramilitaries, get information, et cetera, et cetera, OK? So uh, the bureaucratization is very interesting. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about who these tax collectors were and how they had to be uh, far from the arsenal. Uh, so the finance person, you know, the, finance, the, the tax rates were determined by the military wing. And then these other people came and collected them. Uh, they were in charge of, for example, monitoring uh, production of uh, like English excise taxmen. Uh, the monitoring the production of potatoes uh, and milk, uh, but you know it's very interesting this civilian this notion of how you have to have this civilian bureaucracy separate from the military wing if you're going to really kind of build people's trust and collect taxes effectively. Uh, and you know also that comes up often is this notion of bureaucratization as a way of giving people more confidence in the organisation. Okay, so it sort of says it's always been said that this is Magiva talking in a. Audiencia, it's always been said that the, com the commanders are rich, we're making large profits from the war we're fighting, so I make these reports of incomes and expenditures to show the money was being collected, spent in fighting, because war implies a lot of resources. So it's not like we're kleptocrats and we're stealing the money, we're taxing you, but we need that for the fight, and, you know, and we're providing public goods, uh, which is order. Okay, how do I know this unpatrimonial? Well, there's lots of ways, but this was something, you know, which, which sort of blew uh, blew our minds, uh, and here's what blew our minds. So I'm going to talk about public good provision in a minute. So one thing that public, the Frente Jose Luis Zuluaga were interested. Who, who was Jose Luis Zuluaga, by the way? That was McGeever's, uh, one of McGeever's brothers who was murdered by the ELN uh, guerrilla group. So, uh, so the, Jose Luis, the Frente Jose Luis Zuluaga was into building houses for poor people. So this is a barrio Piedras Blancas in a, uh, in a, in a, in a vereda in Sonson which was built uh, by the front for poor people. Uh, here's another barrio uh, in La Danta in a different Corrimiento, El Paraiso, uh, which was built by, uh, by the front for poor people. Uh, how did they figure out who poor people, needy poor people who, were, who wanted houses were? You know, you see those things and you think, oh, well, he just built these for the wives of his, the families of his guys in the military, didn't he? No, it's definitely not true. Uh, he got the local Junta de Acción Comunal, which is like a sort of, the lowest level of the state in Colombia. You know, you have the sort of the national level, there's a departmental state, there's a municipality, so the municipality has a mayor, it has a kind of, you know, um, there's a mayor, there's a, like a little other, le not legislators, I don't know, it's not what legislators, but what you call them, consejos. You have like councillors who are elected, and then right at the bottom, you have these juntas de acción comunal. So he got the local junta to basically identify the neediest person, people in the community, uh, he also claimed, although it doesn't exist, he still said it doesn't exist anymore, he did a survey of this uh, one municipality uh, uh, to identify who were the poor pe poorest people, the most needy people, and then he, they built these houses, they put the keys in a bag, and then people drew the keys at random out of the bag in order to figure out which house was theirs. Okay? So, so, so this is a sort of remarkably unpatrimonial way of uh, delivering uh, services. Okay? Uh, the fiscal system, as I said, uh, uh, they don't call them taxes, they call them contributions. Uh, uh, they, con they, they taxed, <laughs> they asked for contributions from milk and potato producers. Uh, they taxed drug dealers, uh, and not just drug dealers, 
but this thing called the cartel de gasolina, as I'll tell you about in a second, which was this mafia that steals petrol. It's a, there's a huge kind of illegal market for stolen petrol in Colombia. Uh, and and, and the, the, so they were very organized in taxing them. Uh, they were not involved in a kind of drug dealing. Uh, in fact, they taxed drug dealers. And Ramon Isaza uh, famously fought a war with Pablo Escobar. So actually, in this Puerto Triunfo, this municipality where Isaza was from, that's actually where this famous Hacienda Napoles is. So Fab Pablo Escobar had this massive 14 square kilometer farm actually in the municipality of Puerto Triunfo. So they were right like cheek by jowl with Pablo Escobar here, you know, the big Colombian drug dealer. They actually fought a war against Pablo Escobar. So, so there's very little evidence that they, they taxed drug dealers, but there's very little evidence that there was, uh, they were involved in it. Although there's some suggestion that Rocky uh, uh, was involved in it uh, OK, I talked about the tax collectors. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of discussion about how these taxes were uh, collected. So when uh, McGeever uh, first sort of took charge in 1998 of this territory, uh, I mean, he then expanded, but the core of the territory, what he did was he called together people like landowners and businessmen to these meetings and sort of explained what the paramilitary project was and explained how everybody had to contribute. Okay, and why did everybody have to contribute? Because he was providing public goods, he was providing order, and he didn't want people free riding. Okay, so there's actually beautiful descriptions of like the problem of free riding. We're doing something for everybody, and of course people have this incentive not to take part in that, but we're not going to let them. So everyone has to come to the meetings. Uh, you know, uh, anyone who did not come become the enemy of the ones who participated. Uh, and everyone had to contribute for the cause uh, and security. And there's also a very interesting discussion of sort of negative externalities because, of course, if you didn't come to one of these meetings and everybody else did, then when the guerrilla, when the left-wing guerrillas came, you know, you could say, well, I didn't take part in that, but that guy took part in it, you know, helping the paramilitaries. And they didn't want that because then people would become targets. Of the, so everyone had to kind of show uh, solidarity. And in fact, you know, one thing he said also, which is very interesting about, you know, uh, so we've been trying to get a lot at this question of patrimonialism and clientelism and why wasn't he more patrimonial? Why wasn't he more clientelistic? And, and you know, one of the things he said is that, you know, well, look, you know, if you give, if you start giving favors to everybody, first of all, that's what all the politicians in this stupid country do, and that's why Colombia is such a mess. So that's one of his lines. Another of his lines is, well, look, you know, you're trying to get people's support. You know, if I give some people a favor and not someone else, that person comes to me and says, Magiva, why didn't, you know, you gave that person, you're creating favorites here. Or maybe they don't come to me, maybe they go to the FARC and say, ah, you know, Magiva and his guys are in town, you should attack today. So, so it would sort of, it's like an O-ring technology or something. If I just provide clientelism, then some people are disgruntled. And en even one disgruntled person can provide information to the, to the guerrilla. And you can't have that. It's, you know, so, so, so there's different motivations. OK, what about the public goods? OK, well, there were lots of public goods. Uh, he built houses of poor people, as I showed you. He electrified rural veredas. He built 176 kilometers of road. He built schools. He paid for teachers and musical instruments. Uh, he paid for a drama teacher in the school in La Danta, which was like his capital. It turns out the drama teacher was a supporter of the guerrilla. Uh, so he had to kill him after he'd, uh, uh, after he'd hired him. They rebuilt the old age people home. Uh, they started an artisan center, sports stadia, bull ring, uh, rehabilitation center for drug addicts. Uh, how do I know this? Well, it's all uh, here. This is La Danta. This is like Google, Google Earth map of La Danta, which was his sort of capital. And here's the bull ring. I'll show you some photographs of that in a minute. It's really awesome. Uh, you know, this is the El Paraiso I showed you before. Uh, there's a health center, I'll show you uh, that. This is a kind of, this is a patchwork picture of the road network he constructed around La Danta. So La Danta is here, uh, right in the middle, uh, and you know, Puerto Triunfo is just off to the right. So this is, I should go back to that first map and remind you where this is, just to show you. So this is the health clinic he built. Uh, it's a rather amazing place. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a school he built in Piedras Blancas where he built the houses for poor people. Uh, I mean, the reason you know, I, we went and we investigated this because, was because the first time, this is another school he built in El Pulvanir, which is another rural vereda near there, was you know, the, the first reaction when, when we learned about this from people in Bogota was, oh, that's all 
BS. You know, no paramilitary ever did anything like this. It's just rubbish. You're just, you're just like, you're just internalizing some stupid nonsense that they said to try to impress people. So that was why we wanted to really figure out whether this was true or not. And it's all true. Here's a road he built. Uh, this is a road. Uh, this is in San Francisco, which is another municipality further north, actually, where he was born. And this is what the roads look like. You know, now you might say, gosh, you know, isn't the t where's the tarmac? You know, shouldn't there be tarmac here and like white and cat size and things like that? But this was a sort of mule track, you know. So a gravel road, when, when you previously had a mule track, is like quite a cool thing. Uh, here's more roads. Here's the Plaza de Toros, the bull ring with the sacred family uh, in the background there. Uh, it's rather a fine thing. OK. So, so lots of public goods, specialization, lack of patrimonialism. I don't know. Seems like a state to me. Of course, you know, there's, it didn't get a place in the UN, you know, but the Taiwanese aren't in the UN either, you know. So, OK. So, what was the motivation? It's absolutely clear what the motivation for this stuff is. You know, why do all this? Why build these roads and bull ring sports? You know, like, what's the point? Well, it's all about the conflict, OK? It's about the fight against these left-wing uh, guerrillas. And here's McGeever. Social work, which is one of the basis or ideological platforms for us to accumulate masses. I don't really understand the way he uses this word ideological, actually. He talks a lot about ideology, but I don't really understand how he talk, what he means by that. I, he means kind of like anti-guerrillas, I think. Uh, so, you know, he had a very, they had a very systematic strategy for sort of per pursuing this conflict against the guerrillas. And the, the word, you know, the key word which comes up a lot in this discussion is what he calls disintegrar, so disintegrate. So, so he knew a lot of people in the guerrillas. So he grew up in this rural municipality just to the west of where his base was. And he knew people in the guerrillas. He knew their families. He knew the, so he had this strategy of sort of deliberately trying to get people to quit the guerrillas and come and join, uh, come and join him. Uh, you know, for me, it's more valuable a captured, surrendered, or hurt in combat guerrilla member than 50 or 100 of them dead. He certainly killed a lot as well. Uh, disintegrate the opposite group. So, 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 so he, you know, this strategy of public goods, of development, he likes to talk a lot about development, was part, it was very complementary to intensifying the military uh, aspect of the conflict. Okay. Uh, all right. So, let me say something about crimes. Okay, I, I could say something about kleptocracy. I'll, I'll talk about that when I talk about the finances in a second. There were lots of crimes. There's too many numbers uh, to, say, to say here. L let me just to talk about it in detail. Let me give you the big picture. Uh, at the moment, the judiciary, there's the, the whole outer defenses Campesina del Magdalena Medio, the whole block with six fronts is accused of about 10,000 uh, crimes. Uh, in total. So the, all sorts of crimes, displacing people, murdering people, uh, beating people up, uh, stealing land, all sorts of things. Okay, very, you know, there's a huge amount. Of those 10,000 crimes, uh, I'm going to show you some real data in a second. Of, of 10,000 crimes, about 12, about 1,100 of them are specifically attributed to, the, uh, to this uh, front. And, uh, you know, we're still trying to get a database of these 10,000, eventually we'll get all the 10,000 uh, crimes. Uh, so, uh, but we don't have that yet. Uh, but what we know at the moment is from the Fiscalia is that about 400 of these 1,100 are homicides. So there's certainly lots of discussion of people being killed. Uh, so this is not, you know, uh, and in fact, this strategy of disintegrar, after they, there's many examples of, uh, they capture members of these left-wing guerrillas and then they give them three months to turn them, basically. They put them in the training camp. And then for three months, they, they, they try to implement what he calls the trasbordo ideologico, like the ideological transformation. You have to turn a guerrilla into a paramilitary. And after three months, and you have to get the trust of the other paramilitaries, after three months, if it didn't work, they executed the person. So, uh, uh, so this was three months, and you're out. I don't know. So, so I, you know, so, so. The explanation for all these public goods is not because they, McGeever was a nice guy. He was very ruthless. Uh, he certainly killed lots of people. And, you know, uh, OK, so enough of that. Uh, let me talk about the variation, OK? This is a quote from another demobilized paramilitary that I kind of like. 
uh, from another group called the, the Heroes of Granada. There are two ways to rule people, fear or dreams. We opted for the first, OK? So, so of course, McGeever had fear and dreams. It's not a matter of fear or dreams. There were fear and dreams, OK? So, so this is obviously complementary to uh, fighting and uh, killing people. But the other fronts had much more fear than dreams. OK, so, so here's some data that we've been putting together very painstakingly, uh, and it will go on. So here's, this is the different fronts. This is Ramon Isazas, the Frente Central, which was just in this one municipality, Puerto Triunfo. This is Pajaro's front over the river in western the department of Cundinamarca. This is Terror, the heroes of El Prodigio. This is Rockies, uh, Frente John Isaza, Magiva, and El Gure, the armadillo. Okay. What do we know? Well, we know that Magiva was the only person who had written estatutos. The origin of these estatutos actually come from a gentleman called Carlos Castaño. So Carlos Castaño was one of the people who really started paramilitarism. In, not, he didn't start paramilitarism, but he was one of the people who, in the late 1990s, created this national-wide uh, paramilitary kind of all umbrella organization. So Castaño had, he was the first person who wrote Estatutos. So Magiva adopted and embellished Castaño's written Estatutos. Nobody else had, nobody else used them. So nobody else inculcated the troops. They didn't have them. Okay. What about roads? Well, we know Magiva built 176 kilometers of roads. We know that both uh, El Gure and uh, Pajaro built roads. So we have fragmentary evidence that they built roads, they constructed roads. We don't know the number that's to be determined. So that's something we're going to have to work, we'll have to work on later on in field work. But the other guys seem to have built no roads whatsoever. Okay? Uh, Magiva was uh, the only person who did electrification. We know that, uh, we know from field work that uh, Ramon Isaza also built barrios for poor people. So he built, we, he built barrios. So McGeever wasn't the only one. Uh, he's the only person who built health centers. He was the only person who built schools, although there's some evidence that uh, Gure actually did. He was somewhat, in, he put some new roofs on some schools. So we have to investigate that. Uh, uh, he put a lot of stuff into, uh, you know, rehabilitation centers for drug users, for youths. Uh, so, uh, but Ramon Isaza also did that. He, Ramon Isaza had a kind of prison on an island in the Magdalena where he would put, like, youths who caused trouble or young criminals and stuff, and he tried to rehabilitate them. Uh, and he built all these sports and reconciliation uh, facilities. The others were also involved in, like, social events, you know. So providing liquor, it was Easter weekend, some free food, some booze, some aguardiente, you know. So every, everyone was kind of involved in that. But I don't know if that's, you know, that's... OK, so just to drive home what I've been saying is that, you know, I've talked mostly about this just because that's all I can, you know, because we know much more about this at this point. Uh, but, you know, but this, the picture here, there's some uncertainty about some of the details. But the big picture is totally clear, which is that, you know, McGeever was enormously involved in all this public good provision and all this other stuff, and the other guys to a much lesser extent. Okay, so this, you know, this is the, this is where the social science comes in, which is what on earth explains all this variation across these fronts? And it's even more puzzling because, like I said, they all knew each other. Okay, McGeever was uh, married to Isaza's daughter. Two of the other commandantes were sons of uh, Isaza. So, so they all knew each other, and they all knew what they were doing. Uh, what's the story? Let me talk about the finances in more detail. So we only have data, data on finances for four of the fronts. Why is that? Well, Roque actually never demobilized through the process in 2006. He just disappeared, and he was only captured about six months ago. So he hasn't been involved in this process yet, and he hasn't coughed up any information. And you know, so who was involved in this process? Well, I said there was. Uh, there was about 30,000 paramilitaries demobilized in 2006. But essentially, 28,000 of them just walked away. Okay? So anyone lower down the hierarchy walked away. The only people who went into this peace and justice process who are in prison, sort of prison Colombian style, <laughs> meaning prison with mobile phones and computers and servants and, you know, so, so, so uh, 
prison. Uh, 2000 entered into this prison, this prison business. Uh, they were the senior guys. So in this case of the Auto Defenses de Magdalena Medio, there's about 50 people in prison. So there's these guys, the top guys that I showed you, the commanders, and then there's the lower kind of big commanders like Freddy Bongo, for example. Freddy Bongo is in prison. Uh, okay, so that didn't happen with Rocky. So we don't have financial information from Rocky, and we don't have anything from the Frente Central either. Ramon Isaza says he has Parkinson's disease. He says he can't remember anything, and he didn't, kept, he didn't keep proper records. And so far, we haven't been able to put together the facts from, from other, talking to other kind of sub-commanders in the, in the central front. Here's what we have. OK, so here's Magiva. So what do we say? So here's the incomes at the top. So first of all, you can see Magiva had way more income than anybody else. OK, so what's the main item? The main item here is the legal fuel trade. So this is people uh, stealing petrol from Ecopetrol. So Ecopetrol is a national petrol company in Colombia. They have these pipelines. Uh, and what they do is they break into the pipeline, they put a valve on it, and they just steal the petrol. And they had a very elaborate system of bribing people in Ecopetrol to know how, the, how to do this. So, so they only pump the petrol occasionally. So they bribed people to phone them up and tell them when they were going to pump the petrol. So then they break the pipe, they put the valve on, they steal the petrol. But what's interesting about this, as I'll, and I think helps you discriminate between some types of theories, as I'll see, is that both Pajaro and Gure had Ecopetrol pipelines in their territory. Magiba didn't have an Ecopetrol pipeline in his territory, but he got very organized to stop these people when they were going up to Medellin. So there's two big markets for this in Bogota and Medellin. So when they were driving up to Medellin, he'd stop these tankers and force these people to pay this uh, tax. So even though he didn't have you know, a pipeline in his territory, he got very organized for shaking down these, uh, these petrol mafias. And you can see that he raised way more money that from the others. Okay, so uh, this is you know what other things drug related activities. That's primarily uh, taxing drug dealers. So terror, for example, got more money from that because there was a big kind of sh drug kind of shipment uh, channel uh, going through uh, Puerto Nare. So he was able to shake down these uh, mafiosis uh, uh, growing and exporting coca uh, better than the others uh, were. Uh, uh, what about the other ones? Well, taxing farms and businesses. Uh, Gure made actually more than Magiva did taxing farms and businesses. We actually have a list, you know, we have a list of every single farm and business that were taxed and the owners and everything. Uh, so, you know, why is that? Well, partly because he was down in the river valley, the Magdalena River Valley, where there's big landowners. Like he was even taxing like famous Colombian soccer players who have like big farms uh, down, down, you know. So, there were f the farms were bigger, more profitable, richer, richer elites from Bogota, Medellin, you know, so easier to raise more money taxing these people uh, than, than, uh, than Magiva, okay? Expenditure, uh, you know, what we know is that Magiva spent about 26% of his incomes on providing public goods. So this is the roads, you know, by bulldozers, the Plaza de Toros, buying bricks, concrete. I mean, he also, you know, he, he forced... Uh, construction companies to give contributions. You know, cement works gave free uh, cement, etc., to help build uh, houses. Uh, there was a big, there's a very big uh, cement works in his territory. In fact, uh, who we went to talk to, who like, I, uh, I, I now I know what the expression "the color went out of her face" means uh, when we went to try to talk to someone about Magiva and how they interact. How did the cement factory interact with the paramilitary groups? I thought she was going to keel off a chair with a heart attack. She said, excuse me, I, 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 and then she left the room. <laughs> and then she came back, composed herself and came back with a kind of nice story, pat story. Anyway, so I guess she didn't expect a gringo to start asking about paramilitary. So military equipment and warfare, you know, so uh, maintenance of troops. Uh, the size of the armies varied a lot, as we'll see, uh, if, you know, and so just, you know, so just, uh, you know, I don't know what you want. I want to get out of this. I want to talk about the cartel de gasolina, show that the evidence that we have is that you know uh, is uh, of course you know there's lots of biases involved here because McGeever, because McGeever was much much more organised. You know, he had Excel files and a laptop with all of the incomes and expenditures and everything. So we have humongously detailed information on 
uh, on that. You know, uh, Ramon Isaza, for example, claims to be illiterate, uh, so it was much more difficult for him, you know, uh, to collect information, I expect. Uh, so, so, you know, there's huge differences in organization across these groups, which reflects, it's, which reflects on the how, you know, complete the information is in different ways. Okay, so, so what could explain this variation, okay? Well, uh, let me talk about the state literature and the state literature, this literature on state formation, what creates variation in state formation, patterns of state formation. I can talk a little bit about this literature on rebel uh, governance. Of course, the most famous idea, states made war and war made states due to Charles Tilly, okay? So what would that hypothesis look like? Well, it would sort of say, what's different between McGeever and these other groups is that he was just much more involved in conflict with these left-wing groups. And so, you know, he was fighting a lot and, he, and killing people a lot, but he was also doing all of this public good provision because that was just complementary with fighting. Let me say, this is not about the fiscal side of things, okay? Because McGeever got most of his money from shaking down this uh, illegal petrol business. And that's sort of completely orthogonal to the public good uh, provision. So it's not, about, uh, it's not about building a tax base, okay? So it's not about building a fiscal military state in the sense that that's used in the work of John Brewer or other people, okay? Because there's no fiscal side to this stuff. It's much more about hearts and minds, maybe, or getting people on your side. And so, so, it's, it's, it, so, so get that idea out of your head. It's also true that, like, once he set the tax rates, the tax rates stayed the same, even though all this public good provision went on. So you might have thought, like, well, he built all these roads, so suddenly people could get stuff to market, and then shouldn't he have started taxing them more? But it turns out that the tax rates stayed the same over time. So I don't think it's not the fiscal military side, but you can think of other mechanisms linking war to uh, that. And there's certainly some data uh, so far which supports that. So this is, this is way too aggregated. The one thing I, you know, we've just discovered, even like writing this up, is, you know, is that you have to work. So we, do, we aggregated it at the municipal level. So here, for example, uh, oh gosh, let me, uh, that's, let me talk. Uh, let me show this for a second. Uh, so at the top is the number of municipalities in which the front was present. So McGeever was at about eight fronts. Uh, Gure, Gure had a territory which was about twice as large. So he was present in about 20 municipalities. And you can see his, his territory was about 6,500 square kilometers. McGeever's was about 3,500 uh, square kilometers. Okay? So, so, but this level of looking at the municipal level is probably much too aggregated because what we're going to what we're trying to do now is figure out much more kind of closely within these territories how things were structured and where their bases were because it seems like socio demographics and other things are probably much more relevant in the kind of core part of their territory than more uh, than more generally but just working at this municipality level because that's the way we aggregated it for now it's also we we you know we the, We've been trying for one year to get the National Census Office to give us like the micro census data so we can construct stuff at a much lower level. But you know, that's again, it's like about blood out of a stone. Anyway, uh, so here's some data on, for example, guerrilla deaths. So this is data that the, the government collects on the conflict. So some, some of you work on civil war and stuff like that. You probably know there's very rich data on the conflict in Colombia. There's two big sources, one from the government and one from the Jesuits, you know, because there's Jesuit priests everywhere. So the Jesuits collect a lot of data. And so, for example, there's data on guerrilla deaths, okay? So this, and this is averaged over the period 2000 to 2006. These are all hideously like underreported. You know, under in fact, when you actually get into the details of these cases, and then you look at this data that people collected, you can see that they're just missing massive amount of action. But so anyway, this is what there is for now. And I think it paints some kind of picture, which is you see that in the case of McGeever, both the recorded number of incidents where members of the FARC and ELN guerrilla group were kind of killed, according to the government. There's 174 cases in his territory. Uh, there's 100 cases of paramilitary being killed in his territory. So both he had more casualties in his own group uh, than the others did. Uh, and his group was actually smaller than uh, most of them. Uh, and he had more, uh, there were more guerrillas killed. So, so that, you know, I think you can kind of believe uh, as evidence that there was a lot of fighting going on. The government's data on incidences of attacks by guerrillas is also, uh, is also much higher in his 
territory. So, so, so I think the picture that he was fighting much more aggressively against these guerrillas uh, than any of the other fronts is a, is a kind of real uh, picture. Uh, uh, but I guess I'm still, you know, so this is a Tilly-esque hypothesis. So you could say, well, Tilly's right after all, even in Colombia, you know, we can all go home. I'm still struggling with that concept because, you know, the extent to which you fight, you know, uh, and you're organized to fight and prosecute the fight, it seems very endogenous to the whole thing to me. So, 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 so I'm still struggling, but you know, there's certainly some evidence that he fought much more, more killing on both sides, a more intense conflict with the guerrilla. Maybe that's related to it. Okay, one thing which is definitely not true is this idea, which is very popular, that uh, the mafia is like a state. You know, so Tilly actually has another a paper about this in the in the in the in the famous uh, uh, Roishmeyer, Scotch Poll, and Evans bringing the state back in volume, which is called uh, "State Formation as Organized Crime." So this is not organized crime. It's not organized crime, and it's not like the mafia in the way that Gambetta talks about the mafia, because they were not in, into contract enforcement. They were not into providing public goods or private goods or services to enforce contracts. They were providing public goods. They were providing order. They were not providing private goods. So this is not like the mafia at all. Uh, uh, and where is the curse of resources? So the curse of resources, well, uh, you could say, well, hold on. This is the curse of resources, because Magiba didn't have the pi Ecopetrol pipeline. Pajaro and Gure had the Ecopetrol pipeline. So they provided less public goods. So isn't this a bit like Jeremy Weinstein's idea about you know you have more you have natural resources. Natural resources changes the dynamic of interaction between some insurgent rebel group and the community. So at that level, it seems to work. But the problem with that is that Magiva got much more income, as I showed from the cartel de gasolina, than the other guys did, and he didn't need to provide any of those public goods in order to get all of that income. So I don't think this type of idea explains this variation, this very, this variation, either. Uh, there's also this work by uh, Anna Arjona uh, on rebelocracy. I don't know if anyone knows her work. It's very interesting. She's a assistant professor at Northwestern now. This was her dissertation at Yale. So she studied in Colombia uh, the organization and behavior of paramilitary groups and rebel groups. But I, you know, I'd say that her the it's very difficult to apply her theory to this type of uh, situation. So what she claims is that uh, rebel groups sort of provide public goods in two circumstances. When they have a kind of long time horizon, uh, uh, you know, did these guys have a long time horizon? I don't know. It's hard for me to think. They probably did. Uh, you know, they were there for a long time, after all. They started in 1977, and they quit in 2006. Uh, but it's very hard for me to see that the time horizon varied across the groups, so, so across the fronts. So as a source of variation, that doesn't look very important. And the other thing she emphasizes a lot is civil, is civil society, that civil society can oppose these groups' control. And if civil society opposes control, then that makes it more difficult for these groups to provide order or anything else. But I, you know, I mean, I just, we just really haven't thought, I mean, civil society such as it exists in this part of Colombia just doesn't, seems completely powerless, you know. I mean, as somebody, you know, somebody said to me when I was trying to ask some subtle question about civil society, he said, uh, you know, if I have a gun and you don't, I, I rule. So, you know, so these guys had guns and they weren't afraid to use them. And, you know, the idea of somehow civil society kind of collectively opposing this or altering anything doesn't seem terribly plausible to us, okay? So, so you know, these arguments, I mean, you could think of more. I'm sure lots of people here can think of more. Uh, they don't seem to work uh, very much for us, you know. But let me kind of emphasize, you know, I think it's sort of clear, you know, that there was this strategy of public good provision. It was very complementary to fighting. But, but why did McGeeva choose one model and the others not? Uh, now, of course, you know, we're trying to ask these guys. You can actually go and talk to Gure and ask Gure, you know, so <laughs> why didn't you build schools and, you know, or McGeeva? Or, but, you know, they don't think of it like that, you know, somehow. So you have to get into their psychology and you have to understand how they thought about it and 
how they thought about what they were doing. And, but I guess one of the things which is particularly kind of interesting about this research is you can actually go talk to the people who made the decisions. So these were quite loosely institutionalized structures. So obviously the commandantes played an important role. And I have to say, you know, as we've thought about this, you know, one thing that doesn't strike us as very plausible, it was on a previous slide, I missed it, you know, one thing that doesn't strike us as very plausible is that there's some obvious kind of structural type explanation for this. Meaning, uh, if you look at poverty, educational attainment, you know, land inequality across these municipalities, you don't see huge differences in these kind of underlying socioeconomic uh, variables, okay? So there's huge variation in these strategies, but so far we haven't seen that this is going to be related to any of these uh, underlying kind of socioeconomic. I have a table, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking too much, so, so I want to shut up and let other people talk. So, so far we haven't seen, you know, you don't see much, okay? So what could explain it? Let me just say a little bit about that, and then I'll shut up. We don't have a definitive, this is an ongoing project, so I hope it's not too preliminary to talk about, but it's too late now. So, <laughs> so, so we're, we're still thinking about ideas. I guess that's why it's even more fun to talk about, really. And here's one idea which is sort of like we've, we, we've come to just talking about this and trying to study these people's history, which is that you know, it's kind of obvious when you talk to these guys that McGeever is very different. OK, fine. You know, he's cleverer or whatever. OK, they're all totally uneducated kind of campesinos. So, so they're not, some of these big paramilitary leaders were elites, you know. Uh, they were elites, they came from high social backgrounds, high society, et cetera, et cetera. But these, none of these guys, they were not elites. They were all poor campesinos. They all left school very early on. But if you were a political scientist and were at Michigan, you might have read about political socialization. Now, I've never thought about this kind of stuff before. It's a totally new thing for me. But one thing that's very interesting is how the, the commandantes talk about their life stories. And how do they talk about it? Well, McGeever continually talks about how he grew up in the countryside. His father was a hard-working uh, Paisa. Paisa are people from Antioquia. So Paisas are people from Antioquia. They have this work ethic, hard-working campesinos, growing maize and coffee and stuff like that. Hard, you know, he's always going on about that. What about the other guys? Well, Rocky and, and uh, Terov, you know, they were sons of Isaza. They grew up around guns and killing and paramilitarism. Uh, Gure, uh, you know, there's a very disturbing story about how Gure, the magistrate asked Gure, how did you become a paramilitary? And he told the story about how he was living with his mother on a farm, and the FARC used to come and shake everyone down for money. And they were trying to kidnap the owner of the farm. And there was like a mayor domo, mayor domo who was there. And they said, and they kept telling the guy, well, tell the owner to come so we can, you know, kidnap him. And he, no, 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 no. So, so then the FARC kidnapped the mayor domo. They cut him up and they brought him back and gave him to the people in the farm with their gro with groceries and they ate him. So, uh, so the people ate. They cooked and ate the mayor domo. And then he became a paramilitary. So a lot of these guys grew up in very traumatic kind of violent situations. So, so one of the things that seems to be very different is, is uh, some sort of process of, I think this sounds very flaky for me, you know, is if you believed in political socialization, these people seem to have had very different kind of histories prior to getting into paramilitarism. Some of them, the ones that were killing, not providing public goods, seem to have grown up around guns and killing and fighting and paramilitarism. And the ones that were slightly different, including El Viejo himself, including Ramon de Saza, had much more you know, non-violent, hard-working campesino uh, upbringing. And maybe you have to understand, be Colombian to understand what Paisa means. OK, so, so that's something we're trying to think about. I don't know. This is a very I said my, I told my colleague Peter Hall about this, and he said, that's a very unfashionable type of argument in political science. So I, I, I thought that was a plus rather than a minus. But anyway, <laughs> so you, know, you can shoot me down, political socialization. Uh, the other thing, here's some other ideas that are interesting. Like, you know, one is avoiding the army. The Colombian army, very interested in counterinsurgency. So one thing that's very interesting about, uh, for example, uh, take uh, Gure. 
Agure's base was in a place called La Dorada, where there's a vast military base. You might wonder, how could you have a paramilitary group in a place where there's a vast military base? Welcome to Colombia. <laughs> uh, uh, his, there were a lot of ex-military guys in Gure's uh, force. So if you're close to army bases, the army basically drag you into this business of counterinsurgency. So they entered into relationships with the military. The military would get them to go and kill suspected guerrillas or kill you know, uh, troublemakers, etc. So one problem is being corrupted by the army. Another problem is just urban areas seem to be corrupting. So, so one thing that Magiba talks about is, well, oh, paramilitarism in urban areas. That's, you know, you get into killing thieves and drug dealers and people, people demand that you come and execute. This is what they claim. So that uh, it distorts the project. You've got what they call, you know, social cleansing, limpieza social. That, that being in urban areas, governing urban areas is something very different. Uh, avoiding powerful political elites also seems to be very important. So uh, one thing which is very interesting about where Magiva was based, it's a very peripheral rural area. Uh, he kept out political elites, as I'm saying. But what's very interesting about lots of where the others were based, El Gure, for example, in this town of La Dorada, was a fame, very famous, uh, extremely corrupt machine politician called Victor Renan Barco, who successfully dragged him into the business of uh, eliminating opponents, helping him fix uh, elections, uh, etc. So, so one way of trying to think about this, I don't know how you take, seriously you take political socialization, is that there's a lot of forces, you know, you could think there's two strategies here. One is fear and dreams, you know, and the other one is much more fear and very few dreams. And there's lots of forces which can sort of push you or drag you in one direction or in the other direction. One is, you know, avoiding powerful, the role of political elites, urban areas, army, uh, you know, and there's a lot of discussion on this. One of my favorite quotes, uh, mayors wouldn't cut, this is McGeever talking about autonomy from the traditional political class. They wouldn't come here because they, they knew they'd have trouble with me. We were the de facto authority in the region and there were no links with politicians. You know, why would I construct public work so other people could take the credit for it? So, uh, okay, so, so, so this is, you know, this is, this is all very tentative. We're all still thinking about it. But the, from my point of view, that makes it kind of exciting. I, you know, I don't know. I haven't managed to fit this. We haven't managed to fit it into some little box yet. Uh, but I think it's a setting where you can talk about these big theories in uh, sociology and political science about state formation. And you can think about how it fits in this much more micro uh, context. Uh, eventually, there's a big project. I won't talk about Los Pastinos, Los Patinos. But the big project that we're kind of launched on, which you know I'll, I'll probably be retired by the time we finish it, is there are 34 of these blocks. So there's about 150 fronts in the entire country. So our current plan is we're trying to get very micro evidence for this one front so we can take a kind of statistical approach. We can kind of start thinking about how to run regressions within the Magdalena Medio. But there's also you know, a much broader national uh, you know. Uh, issue of uh, variation across these different blocks and fronts. So let me, I've gone on much too long, so let me shut up and people can ask questions about this mess. You, how do we do this? Shall I just I'll call the people? Yeah, yeah sir. Yeah, uh, I'd actually like to ask a question about the, the state literature with respect to this, which is one could say that what the state formation literature is really about is the selection pressures of the environment rather than the individual responses. And so that it might be that the pressures of the environment over time select out for certain sorts of forms as opposed to others. So my question is, given that what MacGyver did is so different from others, is there any evidence that in some sense he was more successful than sort of the parallel organizations in other, in other areas? In, in any sense, like, would he, would he be seen as like a natural successor yeah. to the old guy? So that, was there any sense of... Yeah, so that's a great, that's a great question. So it could be that, that if you just let this thing run, the other guys would have got selected out, basically. So I can tell you one thing which we know is true for a fact, is that the attitudes towards people to these, pe uh, to these guys are very, very different. So if you go to you know, where MacGyver was, uh, people, you know, of course, people are cautious <laughs> about criticizing any of these people. You know? I mean, the whole, all these places are full of these demobilized combatants anyway. But 
People are very happy to talk about all the good things he did. People say, oh, it's that he shouldn't be in prison, he should come out, you know, and people, you know, and there's no reason why they could say that. They could just say nothing, you know. There's some things people won't talk about. They won't talk about the taxes. No one will talk about anyone paying taxes. No one will admit, you know, we talk to businessmen and stuff, nobody will admit they paid taxes when they all were. And no one will talk about drugs. Uh, but all of the other stuff they'll talk about. Whereas if you go to, you know, we haven't, we haven't done a lot of field work in this area where Gure was, but we have friends like in the judiciary and police who go there. And they'll tell you, you know, you go into a town, uh, you know, and, and people will like run into the forest because, they, you know, you turn up in some Toyota Land Cruiser, they think it's some paramilitaries coming and everyone just runs into the forest. So, so you know, so, which suggests people are terrified of them. So, so, so this, I'd say was you know very very different. He was very, he was much much better at really kind of creating some constituency uh, within the society that supported him and saw his activities as beneficial to the community. So you know you might have thought that that was something which was very crucial for generating. I mean it's interesting like what you know were they successful or unsuccessful? I suppose what were they trying to do? They were trying to control territory and defeat the left wing guerrillas. So one thing which is very difficult is to actually collect information about where these left-wing guerrillas were. And you know, they moved around. They, didn't, they weren't fixed in some sense. So you know, who controlled territory better? You know, who, uh, you know, that's difficult to get a handle on. But the, the only thing I can say is that we do know that the people's attitudes in the community were very, very different. So that could be, seems like that must be relevant. Yeah. Sir, no, you. Uh, yes, yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering, so you mentioned that for the most part there's a constant threat from the guerrillas throughout these, these different areas, but uh, to what extent is this a question of competition? So I, I know that you want to focus on these on this block first, but is it possible that MacGyver faced more competition from other paramilitary blocks? It shows the map, but is, yeah. did, did they really have a completely consolidated control over those that are highlighted, or are there other blocks that would be competing? They, they, I mean, they were certainly next to other blocks. So, like on the other side of the river was this outer defenses del Puerto Boyacá. South was a was the outer defenses del Tolima. You know, then there were to the to the kind of north there were other groups. There was this this bloque that was this uh, Eros del Grenada and bloque Metro, and so so they were. But I I. You know, they came into conflict with Pablo Escobar. They, th there was not real, there were parts where there was competition over territory. But I guess one of the things is that when Castaño, in, in 1997, Carlos Castaño formed this uh, AUC, which was this national body, there was an attempt to sort of coordinate territory, to sort of stop fighting within these groups. I mean, there's, certain example, there's certainly examples, like the Bloque Metro and this other Bloque in Medellin fought, fought a war, basically, and the Bloque Metro ultimately was like eliminated by this dot big guy called Don Berner, who was a drug dealer who started it. He got in late into paramilitarism. He started his own block, and Bloque Metro was run by a guy uh, called Double Zero, who was a former military officer who thought that the drug dealers were bringing paramilitarism into you know into disrepute. So he was like, we don't want these drug dealers involved in paramilitarism. That this is not what it's all about. And then he ended up fighting these, those two blocks fought a war, basically. And he ended up getting bumped off uh, double zero. So there were some conflicts like that. But here, I haven't got a sense that there's, that's a real issue in sort of determining the control. Yeah, they were competing like mad with these left-wing groups. We're trying to find a better way of pinning down where these left-wing groups were. Uh, were based. And, and I guess one thing we could try to do actually is talk to some of these left wing guerrillas. One of the big left wing, one of the big FARC uh, commanders was this lady called Karina, who's actually in prison in a military base in Cordoba. So I guess we could go talk to her. And she was actually fighting with Magiva. So her perception of what was going on would actually be pretty interesting if she talked to us. Uh, but yeah. Yes, please. Um, just looking at the, the sort of people where you had various economic profiles of the different. Yeah. Countries. I mean, it, sounds, it almost suggests like it would be the relative absence of conflict and the relative wealth of MacGyver's uh, operation allowed him to fight for conflict, right? So maybe it's not a question, maybe this is just a question of opportunities. This is a question, you know, he was, because there was a relative absence of conflict in his area and because he was so wealthy, he could afford to buy dreams rather than rule by fear. 
Uh -huh. Maybe this is sort of, you know, an inverse of, you know, sort of maybe coercion is cheaper than public good provision in this situation, and he could simply could afford right. to write the bill. Well, he was much, yes, he was much wealthier. Yeah, he was much wealthier because, you know, but why was he wealthier? Because he got organized to, to shake down this cartel de gasolina. So, you know, I, it's, a bit, it's not really exogenous that he was wealthier. I mean, I guess you could say, well, but he, he, you know, he was sort of on this main road up from the Magdalena Medio to Medellin. He was on the autopista up, which he actually he resurfaced some of the main road, uh, uh, 11 kilometers of the main road between Bogota and Medellin. Uh, uh, so, uh, so I guess you know, maybe there's, you could argue that he, he didn't have the pipeline, but somehow he was at some crucial like, point where they had to come. So that made it easy for him to block and tax them or something. The, the wealth could be, you know, a, a factor you know, caused by any number of factors, right? But yeah. he's, he's wealthy, right? He can basically, the argument here is that he can afford to provide yeah. public goods. So right. it doesn't really matter what the source of wealth is for the argument. The only problem would be if the public good provision basically led to their wealth in the first place. And it doesn't sound like that's the story. So yeah, it's not. you take the wealth not. being exogenous, yeah. he basically can afford to right. buy public goods yeah. and yeah. not have to rule by coercion because it's cheaper. Right. Yeah, that, I mean, yeah, that's consistent with that, yeah. I'm sort of curious about this because in some ways it isn't really a public good, you know, housing. It's excludable and there are people who don't get housing and I wonder what their reaction might be to not receiving the house. I mean, potentially it could backfire. Uh-huh, yeah. Well, you know, the order is a public good. The roads are public goods. Uh, uh, to the extent that we were able to investigate this, you know, uh, everybody had access to this health clinic. I mean, you're right that the houses are a private good. And, uh, uh, but you know, what, what impressed us was the fact that you know, there was a very kind of objective process whereby these people were identified and given these houses. So I mean, it could be that other people were irritated that, uh, that they didn't get the houses. And I, I, I mean, we haven't really understood why did he do one thing and not the other. You know, schools, for example, he built these schools, you know, and that was open to the community. Uh, so, yeah, you're right about the houses. Yeah, the houses are different. And I, I, I haven't, you know, I mean, we didn't hear anyone, no one complained to us about, hey, built those people houses, and did, we, did they? And we didn't get a house. He recruited lots of guerrilla members, and the, he would put them in these nice houses. So his own guys would complain about him putting guerrilla, former guerrilla members, in the nicest houses. Yeah. That's so that Yeah. And in fact, someone, someone in San Miguel, San, San Miguel is like a, is a town which was just on the border of uh, Ramon, Isaza's, Ramon Isaza's territory and Magiba's territory. And th what this councillor told us was that people, you know, people would complain to Ramon Isaza about, like, Magiba builds all this stuff for people. He built this sports stadium, and he brought like, these big soccer teams from Medellin also to come and play so that the kids could see like, great soccer matches. So he got these people to come and play and, you know, and put on a you know, big show like that. And people would complain you know, to Ramon Isaza, why didn't you do why don't you do that here? You know, McGeever's doing that just down the road. You should be doing it here. And then the guy also told us that Ramon Isaza would complain to people that McGeever's, McGeever's army was like full of all these ex-communist guerrillas, and you know he didn't want, he didn't like those people, and so he wouldn't go there because he didn't like all these demobilized communists. Uh, so we, we unfortunately, you know, we have this data on these CVs, which I didn't have time to talk about. Uh, Unfortunately, it's very non. Ah, oh, sorry, that's a. I, I, this is a danta. It's a tape here. Sorry, if you didn't know what a danta was, it's a tape here. Uh, we have these uh, CVs, which are very incomplete. Uh, unfortunately, why are they incomplete? Well, uh, Magiba had 250 men in his army, uh, uh, all men. I don't think there was. There were, he had nurse and lady. He didn't have any female. The guerrilla, you know, the FARC guerrilla actually have a lot of women combatants, but that's not true of paramilitaries. Uh, the, this is the Gure. Gure had about 1,000 uh, armed uh, soldiers, of which only 112 appeared at this demobilization to fill out this survey, whereas 90% you know, of Magiva's guys actually appeared, which is very telling in itself. You know, this was, he was very organized. He told them, you know, we're demobilizing. You have to turn up to Puerto Triunfo and demobilize. They all showed up. Whereas what happened when Gure said, OK, we're demobilizing, is most of his people just kind of disappeared. You know? uh, so, so that means that these are very biased, unfortunately, these numbers. So we're trying to uh, understand 
you know, kind of what to do, uh, what to do uh, about this. I think some of these numbers are very interesting, you know, in terms of like, for example, percentage of members who belong to armed forces. Uh, that was very high in these places where there were military bases, but it was very low where McGeever was. One of the questions they asked was the, when they when they demobilized was, you know, did you used to be a member of the FARC or the ELN or any of these communist groups? But none of them basically admitted it, unfortunately. So I mean, I think in the whole sample, there's like five people who said yes, and we know that's definitely not true uh, because probably from McGeever's group, you know, at least a half were actually demobilized, you know, were former members of these guerrilla groups, but they just don't. I guess they just were, they were just worried that it was going to be used against them, so they all lied. So, I, so I, I, we didn't even put the numbers here. I mean, you could say, well, some of this other stuff must be, you know, members of criminal records. <laughs> Maybe this is all nonsense too. But anyway, we're still struggling with this. So, you know, we're very interested. Like one of the theories which uh, a lot of people like is this idea that uh, if you, if the people in the paramilitary group are local people, then you're going to get very different dynamics within the community. So for example, if you look at these numbers that we tried to calculate, because they say where they were from, like what, what, where they were born and things like that, we can try to calculate the percentage of members who are from the front territory. That's very high in McGeever, 54%. But it's also very high in the, 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 the Gure thing. But I think that's almost, we think that's almost surely because this is a massively selected sample, that what happened when Gure's guys demobilized is that the people who were from the region demobilized, and all the others just went back to wherever they were from. So that number here, which looks as high as McGeever, which is up at 54%, is probably massively, it's a massive over, it's not representative of the larger block, but 900 people we didn't, you know, we, and we have no way of tracing those people, I don't think. Uh, so we didn't, yeah, okay. Yes. Yeah. A bit more centrally volatile than having a pipeline run through your your district. So maybe there is some aspect of this. I mean, I think kind of winning hearts and minds and building a tax base can be related, but maybe there is some aspect of this where he's trying to generate a more stable source of revenue. You know, it seems easier for a truck to find another route around um, his sort of district than it is to move a pipeline. Right. Yeah. I mean, the truck certainly could. You know, even if you're going to Medellin. There's a road south that goes to Manizales, and you could go north. So instead of going on the main road, you could, you know, you could go something else, which is probably, I don't know, 50 kilometers further, or maybe 100 kilometers further. But I guess you could do that if, uh, if you were, uh, you know, got upset enough about that. Uh, but you know, but, but your argument is what that? Well, this was a long-run plan, but it just got, it just didn't bear fruit in the amount of time available, or. Or that he sees that potentially that. That source of revenue is going to dry up, or they're going to find ways around it because they need to develop this sort of more right. stable. Right. I mean, what's true is that, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that could be. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. That's an interesting. I mean, that'd be a good question to ask him. Okay. <laughs>